Grace and peace. Today we continue our Epiphany series titled, Who Are You? We're taking a look at the identity of Christ and our identity during this Epiphany season. And so, so far, we have uh, kind of come up with this series idea, this main idea, and I had this wonderful thing made today, or last week it was given. It's a wood block with this phrase on there, God is love and we are God's Beloved, and I'm going to hold on to this and remember this time forever with you guys. This is such an amazing uh, gift, but this phrase is a gift. But what the meaning of it is, is the greatest gift. It's the fact that we can define who God is. We can understand who God is as we understand what love is. For God is love. And then we are recipients of that love. We are God's beloved. And that's what we've been kind of unpacking during this season. Uh, God is love and we are God's beloved. If you read the gospel passage, which Ted just read, uh, it, the, the theme of light emerges. In fact, salt and light. But if you remember last year, we kind of did a deep dive on salt. So today, uh, I'm gonna, we'd like to focus in on that idea of light. And so I rack my brains because each of the sermons are titles are inspired by songs from my either childhood or teenage years. And and the song that came to mind uh, that inspires this um, uh, sermon today, or at least the title of it, is the one by the doors called Light My Fire. Anybody remember that song? Yeah? Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's actually it was actually released in 1967, which was a year before I was born. But it was an incredibly popular song. It went straight to number one and hung out there for quite a while. Uh, they got into it was, you know the Doors. It's an interesting an interesting band with an interesting story. But uh, for me, when I think of "Light My Fire" by the Doors, it takes me back to a time in which that particular song kind of was lodged into my brain. In 1991, uh, I went with my buddy Eric to see uh, Oliver Stone's movie called The Doors, right? And it was explaining the rise and the tragic fall of The Doors, specifically the lead singer, um, uh, Jim Morrison. And I I loved that movie. I loved uh, learning about that time and learning, you know, when I was born, that whole age I knew very little about. 
and uh, I enjoyed the music behind the songs. And so I went and got the catalog of the Doors music. I, I went and bought the cassette tapes. Anybody remember cassette tapes? Yes, cassette tapes and listened to the Doors and I fell in love with the music. They were musical geniuses. The organ with one hand and the bass on a piano on the other. I know Michelle can do that, but I was blown away that they didn't need a bass player. They could do it on the, on the organ, so that was pretty cool. And the guitar player, uh, Robert Krieger, was amazing. But anyway, their big first hit was Light My Fire. Of course, it's a song about sex and drugs, and we're not going there today. But anyway, it's a song also about light and fire, and uh, that is where we're going to kind of land today. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, music is experiential. It, when you hear a song, it typically can transport you back to a time in which a memory was lodged in your brain. Maybe you hear a song on the radio where someone mentions a song and all of a sudden you are no longer present. You are back there somewhere when you heard that song the first time or something was going on. Music is experiential. It's, it's, a, it's a love language, right? We know that something about music in, is in the brain, right? We, we know people who have dementia that are able to hear songs and all of a sudden it'll click, right? Something is in the brain when it comes to music. So music is experiential. But oftentimes Christianity in the year 2023 has kind of shifted from experience to information. And, and I would like to suggest today as we take a look at this text, I don't, I don't think that's what God has in mind. I don't think that information is the goal of Christianity. I don't think the goal of, of Christianity or church service is to learn about Jesus only. I believe that the point of Christianity is to experience Jesus. Would you agree with me? Say amen. And so to a certain degree in this world of information, when we are bombarded with information, and information is not bad, it is good, we have to be careful that we don't become so information driven that we lose the relationship or the experience of Jesus Christ. And so just like music is experiential and something is lodged into the brain, I believe that we have to uh, focus in today on the experience of knowing Jesus. You remember last week we talked about the Sermon on the Mount and these people climbed the mountain with Jesus, the, the disciples, the twelve, but there was also others. And a lot of the people that climbed the mountain with Jesus were broken. These were people who were, uh, who were either sick or whether they were, had physical ailments. Uh, these are people that were poor. 90% of the population in that day was poor. These are the outcasts. These are the broken. And they climb up the mountain with Jesus. And Jesus delivers his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon of all time. And it wasn't just about information. It wasn't that he had a three-point sermon and everyone said, good, good sermon, Jesus, great job, you know, when <laughs> everyone left. I, I, love, I, I keep bragging on the show, The Chosen, but there's something about visually seeing something come to life, right? And The Chosen did a great job with Sermon on the Mount as Jesus delivered the sermon and there was all of these people, all different walks of life there. And then after the sermon and the weeks that followed, everybody started, kept talking about that sermon. They kept talking about that moment. They kept talking about what happened. In other words, that information turned into experience, and that experience was lodged into their minds and their heart. They, they were living something that wasn't just uh, an information where they memorized it. And so today, I want us to, as we take a look at light, uh, Jesus says that we are the light of the world. I like us to look at that text and the entire Sermon on the Mount through the lens of experience. The big idea for today is this. God is love, and we are God's beloved community. We are loved individually, but we're also part of a community of loved people where everyone has a seat at the table, where everyone is welcome. The, this community is, is very inclusive. It reaches out beyond itself. That's who we are. We're God's beloved community. But we are disciples. We are focused on God's kingdom coming 
on earth as it is in heaven. We recognize as kingdom disciples that there is a mission going on and we have a part to play with it. And here comes the light. These kingdom disciples who experience and share the light of Christ. Light isn't just information. Light is an experience. It changes us. And that's what God desires to do in this place today is to transform us. So the text that we're looking at today is in Matthew chapter 5. But really, instead of just focusing in on that text today, what I'd like to do is to kind of talk about the thread of light and fire throughout Scripture. Uh, and, and of course, we can't cover all of the mentions, the hundreds and hundreds of mentions of light and fire within Scripture, but we're just going to pull on that thread a little bit. We're just going to pull on it and see what we come up with as we talk about this metaphor of light and fire. Now, light and fire, uh, when, we, when we think of light, we, we oftentimes think of electricity and things like that. But in, in, in the minds of the people that would have heard this sermon, light would have been uh, fire, it would have been a lamp, it would have been this idea of something that illumines in the darkness, it would have been something that uh, uh, lights the path, it would have been something that like fire would burn away the chaff, it would in purify the impurities, it would warm in the midst of cold. This, this, this light provides life, without light there would not be life. And in the Bible, light has this, is a symbol of God's holiness and God's glory. It's a symbol of God's goodness. It's a symbol of his wisdom. It's a symbol of grace and hope and love. Light is a primary metaphor in all of Scripture. Now, we know darkness. We know evil. We know sin. We know despair. We see it outside of us, and we see it inside of us. God desires to shine his light today in our lives and in this world. If you look at the very beginning of the Bible, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, what do we read? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God created this light. He illuminated all things. And if you go to the very end of the Bible, there doesn't need to be, Je uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, the city does not need a sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its light. Light is a thread that runs all the way from the beginning to all the way to the end. Here's some points about light that I'd like us to discuss today. First of all, God is light. God is light. Now, there's this amazing story of, of Moses. We all know it. It's a story that we learn in Sunday school. It's a story that we, we refer to often. It's the story of the burning bush. We all know that. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. There's Moses. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. You know what happens on mountains? Experiences. Encounters. Every mountain experience in Scripture is in an encounter with God. And so here is Moses on the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Didn't we just sing that? It's funny how those songs just connect and they're unplanned because Michelle had no idea I was going to talk about this. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place that you are standing is holy ground. Did Moses have an experience of God on the mountain? Absolutely. That experience with God in the fire transformed Moses. It was a pivotal point. It was an experience that he remembered for the rest of his life. And of course, Moses had many other experiences, many other encounters with God. And those encounters, those experiences transformed Moses' life. And so when Moses had an experience at the burning bush, God presenting as a fire, and that fire would not, uh, it was burning, but it would not consume that bush as a reminder that God's fire is ever burning, it's ever residing, 
It's ever dwelling. And, and that experience changed and transformed Moses' life. God is light, and God's light changes people. Now, if you take a look in the Psalms, we see a second theme emerge. God's word shines the light, right? God's word is referred to as the light. God's word shines the light. And in Psalm 119, which is all about God's word or the Torah, uh, it says in verse 105, uh, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. The, the Hebrew people that believe that the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the rest of the Old Testament was this relational experience with God. They didn't look at it as just words on a piece of paper. They looked at the Torah as a way of life. And that's what Torah means. It means the way or instructions for life. They believed that somehow God was speaking to them through his word and it was shining the path for them to live. It was showing them the way to live. These were just slaves They were raised as slaves, generation after generation after generation of slave. They did not know what it meant to be a human being. They were dehumanized for 400 years. The scriptures taught them to be be human again. They taught them what it means to be God's people. So God's word shines light. So the first point is God is light. The second point is God's word shines the light. And then we see that it continues in in Isaiah, we'll discover that God's people are also the light of the world. That God's people are also the light of the world. And I love Isaiah 49 verse 6 because it gives us a picture of the mission of this light. Um, It says, he says, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. And this is the key part. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. What is that about? Isaiah is reminding God's people that this light that they've experienced, like Moses at the burning bush, this light that shines the path through the Hebrew scriptures is also changing them to be the light to the world, the light to the Gentiles. God has chosen this family, the family of Israel, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be the light to the rest of the people on earth. This is so very important that we catch this. Moses experienced the light. The scriptures shine the light. And they become God's light to the world. There is this experience that happens when we encounter the divine, the sacred, in the burning bushes of the world on holy ground. And then through his word, we have these encounters every day with the scriptures, with the God of the scriptures. We then become light because of those experiences to shine God's way to the world. In other words, it's not just about God shining light to us. It's meant, to, it's meant for us to experience and flow through us to the rest of the world. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, maybe. Do I need to say it all over again? No, I'm just again. We, God's light shines into us, and we shine the light to the rest of the world. That was the mission of Israel. They were be to light to the world. God chose a family, and that family was to be the light to the world. And so we get to Jesus. Well, how did Israel do as being the light? How are we doing as being the light? Let's not blame Israel, right? I want to make sure we're clear there. Point four is this. Jesus is the light and comes to share the light. Jesus is the light and comes to share the light. In other words, Israel had a hard time embodying the light, being the light. So God sent his son Jesus, not just to die, but that's so significant, but to show us what it means to be the light to the world. In other words, there's a mission there. And so God sends Jesus to embody this light, to embody his word, to come and share the light. So we experience light so we can share the light. John chapter 1 is all about the light, but verses 9 to 12, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Who's the true light? Jesus. Jesus gives light to who? Everyone. 
what, and was coming into the world. He's, Jesus is the true light who gives light to everyone, and he was coming into the world. He was in the world, even, although the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God, to be the beloved. The light came, Jesus came to give light to everyone. In John chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke to the people, this was at the Feast of Tabernacles, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the right, will have the light of life, will have the light of life. Jesus is the light and comes to share the light with us so we can share the light with others. So let's review real quick. God is light. God's word shines the light. God's people are also to be the light of the world. Jesus is the light and comes to share the light. Now let's take a look at the text that Ted read, and hopefully that will give us an understanding of what's going on here. So Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read verses 14 and 17. Uh, Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount is speaking to the crowd who's come up, uh, and he says, you are the light of the world. Now let's stop right there. That you is not a personal you, it's a you all. Y'all. Y'all are the light of the world. He's speaking to the group. It's a plural you. You all are the light of the world. Uh, and notice he didn't say you ought to be the light of the world. He says you are. And I think it's super important because in this American individualized society of ours, we like to pick up our bootstraps and, and, and we like to go to work and we like to work hard and and, and that's who we are, and I'm very proud that that's <laughs> what I was taught to do. But we have to be very careful that we don't think we can work our way into being light. That's not something we can work our way into being. Jesus says to that broken crowd on the hillside, you are the light of the world. In other words, this experience is changing you to be the light. Y'all are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, the purpose of that light is to put it on a stand so it, it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus says, y'all are the light of the world. We are all the light of the world. We don't ha have to do something to become the light of the world. He has given the light as a gift, and it comes inside of us and transforms us. We are the light of the world. The purpose of the light is to do what? The purpose of the light is not to hide it. The purpose of the light is not to put it under a bowl. The purpose of the light is, is to shine, to put it on a stand, to lift it up. So everyone in the house or everyone in the world experiences the light. That's the purpose of the light. Remember what Israel was given the assignment to? They were to be the light to the rest of the world. There's a purpose in light that it's meant to be shared to others. And so Jesus comes and says that he is the light of the world, and then he says that we are the light of the world. He's giving us this light as a gift. Now this next part here, verse 17, uh, I don't want to gloss over because it's super important. Uh, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. Jesus didn't come to to chuck the Old Testament, as a lot of people have done. Uh, I love the Old Testament. I love the Hebrew Scriptures. I love the law. I love the prophets. Those are super important things because they point to Jesus. He didn't come to abolish them, but he came to fulfill them. And that word fulfill uh, means to, to clarify the meaning of. Jesus came to show us the intentions of the Word. He came to embody the Word. The, the Word became life. Uh, it put on flesh. Uh, the Old Testament scriptures became the Son of God. And the Son of God showed us what the Old Testament was all about. God has always been love all the way through the scriptures. And he comes in Jesus to share that love, that light. And so he didn't come to destroy the Old Testament. He came to actually show us who God is. He came to show us who we are. 
And the way that he, in this passage, shows us who we are is he uses the metaphor of light. You are meant to be a light that shines God's love into the world. The, the Bible, the Scriptures, uh, became a person to show us what they look like in real life. And we'll talk more about that next week. So that's what light means. But for us to really, really understand what experience is, I'd like us to do a quick case study. I'd like us to talk about a person who was transformed by the light and radically transformed by the light. And so let's talk about the uh, Saul, uh, who is also known as Paul, as a case study. So Paul, if we know he was somebody who was uh, a strict student of the Old Testament, would you agree? He knew it backwards and forwards. He had memorized, but he missed it. Did we ever miss it? I mean, let's think about it. We use scriptures to defend all kinds of things, right? I see scriptures every day used to define violence. And I'm like, what in the world Bible are you reading, right? The Old Testament is there to help us see who Jesus is. Jesus embodies it. So Paul knew it, but he missed it. And so here he is, Paul on the Damascus Road, traveling to kill Christians. And this is what happens. Notice what he encounters. He says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, pause, the way was what they called Christians. Before the word Christian was given, the, the, the church, before the word church was given, the people uh, uh, disciples of Jesus were referred to as the way because they lived a way of life. Remember, that's what Torah means. Um, whether men or women, he might take them prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So what happened there? He had an encounter and experience with Jesus. Jesus had encountered, came to, to, to Saul as light. He came to Saul as light. He said to Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul wasn't persecuting him. Saul was persecuting Christians. But this connection between Christians and Jesus, this, this union between Jesus and his church, this this connection uh, is, is, is there and evident as he says, why are you persecuting me? Paul was changed right there. Paul was transformed. Saul uh, started to use the name Paul. He, he started to use that name to, to differentiate. He, be, he was a different person. And so uh, he had an encounter on the Damascus Road. Now Paul explains this encounter in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. This is so beautiful. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. See, Paul says he's been crucified with Christ. Something died on the road of Damascus. And, 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 and he died, something died there on that road, but he was replaced by light. And this Christ, this light, now lives in him. There is this connection, this union, this experience this encounter, uh, the light now lives inside Paul. Paul says he's crucified with Christ. It's no longer him that lives, but Christ lives inside of him. Christ lives in me. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, Paul says this, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul is saying that the, the mystery, the mystery which is being known is that Christ now, this light now, lives inside his people. Kind of like how a, a, uh, the Shekinah glory of God lived in the Holy of Holies. The light of God now lives inside his people. People experience the light and the light enters in and lives within the soul of individuals and as the church. And then Paul says in verse 28, he is the one we proclaim. Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we might present ourselves fully mature in Christ. That phrase, in Christ, Paul uses over 50 times in his letters. He's talking about this union 
that people have with Christ. Christ lives in them now. This light is inside of us so that it can shine out. This light does not have to be made. It's not has to be worked for. It resides inside so that it can shine outward. And then in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 in the message, it says, Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ the Master. All we are is messengers, errand runners for Jesus for you. It started when God said, Light up the darkness. And our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and all beautiful. Jesus changed Paul. Jesus changed others. Jesus has changed us. The light is not some distant thing. The light enters in and changes us so that we can become the light. So the big idea is God is love. And we are God's beloved community of kingdom disciples who experience and share the light of Christ. Okay, that was great. We did a thread. We pulled the thread about light. So what? What does that mean for me? Here's the thing I'd like us to wrestle with. How do we experience Jesus? How do we experience Jesus? And then how do we share Jesus with others? How do we experience the light? and share the light. Now, what if that light, that fire is moving all along? And and just remember, we didn't even talk about Pentecost. We could have spent another hour there, right? And the fire of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. But just what we talked about in this little pulling and tugging of the thread, what if this light is all around us? What if this light is actually winning? What if the light is actually dispelling the darkness? But because in our media and on the news, And all over the internet, everything we see here is dark, 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 dark. But what if the light is actually winning and God desires to use broken people like you and I, the island of misfit toys, look around, you know who I'm talking about. God desires to use us as messed up people to shine his light. So we need to have experiences of light, encounters, mystery, union, these things that maybe aren't proper things to talk about in 2023, the church needs to talk about them more and more. God desires to encounter us and experience us. And when does that happen? How does that happen? Well, it happens when we open, our, open the word. It happens when we pray. It happens when we worship. God is light and fire is moving all around us. We think often of emotions. It can be emotional. It also can be quiet. It could be uh, yelling and screaming and shouting like kind of the old school Nazarenes and Methodists running the aisles. and eh, it could be all of that. Or it could be the quietness of a moment. And all of that is good, by the way. But the other way to experience Jesus is when we share his love with others. There's something about when we minister to others or someone ministers to us in which we experience the light. Something really good happens when we enter into somebody's life and helps them. Or somebody enters into our life and helps them. It's almost like Jesus shows up when we're sharing in ministry back and forth. Something happens when we, when we meet a need. Something happens when we stand up for justice. Something happens when we serve in ministry or somebody serves in ministry to us. It's almost like Jesus shows up inside of us. That's the light. That's the experience. So Jesus wants us to experience the light, encounter Jesus, and also share that light. And as we share, we experience Jesus more and more and more. This journey is not about information, even though you and I will learn a lot. This journey is about transformation. And so to close, I'd like uh, to share a story in which somebody uh, that you all know uh, encountered Jesus. This is a story from Jane Gorbin. The sermon series on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood had just concluded, and I, like many others in the congregation, had stood to indicate that I committed myself to making a conscious effort to minister to my neighbors. I wholeheartedly believed in that mission, even though I wasn't sure how that ministry would look for me. After all, I am retired, and my contact with other people is somewhat limited usually just my Christian friends, my church friends. 
I had also been questioning for several months how I, as an older person who was somewhat limited in energy and stamina, amen, who would be able to serve in a meaningful way. Little did I know that God already had a plan for me and a place for how I would serve and minister to my neighbors. Exactly two, uh, exactly two days after the sermon series ended, I made my usual walk to the neighborhood mailboxes where I was approached by my neighbor who lived across the street. He started our conversation by telling me he had something serious to talk to me about. He proceeded to ask me if I'd be willing to serve on the governing board for our homeowners association. After talking with him about the particulars, as I was walking back to the house, I found myself chuckling aloud. How obvious could God be in providing me with a means of ministering to my neighbors? Am I constantly in, I am constantly in awe of my God who guides and directs my life every step of the way. Kind of like a light, right? A God who provides opportunities no matter how young or old I may be or how uncertain I may feel. Great story, isn't it? Light. It's shining everywhere. In here. And God desires to use us to share that light with others. Maybe you don't feel capable. Maybe you don't feel equipped. I don't think Jane quite expected that to happen. But what if we truly believe the light is winning? Now. And God desires to use us to change the world. Maybe there's an experience that we need to have. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this moment, this day, the experience the call to be salt, the call to be light. Help us, Father, not to just take it in mentally as information, but help us to open our lives and our hearts to you, inviting you in. Help us to die to ourselves today where so there's room for you to reside within. Help us to be transformed, to become more and more like you, and help us to share the light of Jesus, not in our own strength, but allow it to flow out to the ends of the world. We thank you, Father, for being the light, sharing the light, changing us to be the light. We pray in Christ's wonderful name. Amen.